Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Naso Zervopoulos, and I'm an underwater cinematographer and a diving instructor. And uh, what I do believe is actually that uh, nature can uh, heal uh, mankind psychosomatically. And when I do refer to nature, I actually refer to one element of nature, which is water, and it's the one that I do understand better. So, um, what I'll do is um, I'll try to tell you four main lessons I learned through the last 20 years of my life, where I was diving almost every day. Uh, what I did learn, actually, and I try to apply in my everyday life, is uh, how to move properly, which means to move calmly and efficiently, how to breathe properly, which means to breathe deeply and slowly, how to communicate properly, which means simple and clear, and overall, I learned that water is uh, therapeutic. So, <clears throat> as lesson number one is concerned, I believe that slow is always efficient. One thing you should know as water is concerned is that uh, water is 800 times denser than air, which means when somebody goes under the water, the sooner he or she accepts this physics law, the better for everybody. It's impossible to move fast in the water, even if you are the fastest person on Earth, it's really hard to move fast in the water. Um, moving slowly is always also really safe. Here, for example, is, um, this happened three years ago. It's one cave between Paros and Antiparos, discovered from an Italian diver. Her name is Sara, is the one in front. The guy behind is uh, one of the best uh, cave diving instructors in Europe, I would say, George. And these two people explore this cave for the first time in their life. What I want to show you here is that uh, they're moving really slow. That's why everything looks quite simple, what they do, even though the environment in this case is uh, quite demanding. Uh, it's not an environment where we can do mistakes. What I want to understand, in this case, for example, which looks quite nice because both move really fast, they're quite at 40 meters depth and around 500 meters away from the exit of the cave right now, is Sarah, for example, here. If Sarah, in this second, would move faster than she should, what would have happened is that all this mud on the bottom of the cave, which is not sand like in the sea, it's like uh, mud, which is lighter, so it goes up, it might need two days to go down again. In a split of a second, you would, nobody would be able to see nothing but nothing. If she would get scared and cut the reel, for example, it's the only way to go back home, probably what you would see would be an accident, and I would definitely not be here right now. So I guess I'm here because she moved slowly. Um, <clears throat> yes. Uh, second, whoops. Okay. What I want to say also is that uh, as law is concerned, 20 years ago I used to practice martial arts. I was not good, but I had a really good uh, instructor. He was telling me all the time to move like I was in the water. We were practicing Tai Chi, so I would observe these Chinese people practicing, and first days I couldn't understand what they were doing. They were really slow, doing movements, like this. They would need 10 minutes to go here, and I could not really understand how this can help your health, how this can make you stronger, or how this can make you a good fighter. 20 years later, I think I started to understand what my instructor used to say, and I tried to understand why these people move so slowly. So the idea is, if you spend 50 years of your life trying to do this step as slow as possible, it means every cell of your body is aware in this action and it's moving slowly and you control every cell of your body. It means 50 years later, if you have to use this knowledge, you shouldn't, but if you have to, you will be able to move as fast as nobody here will be able to see your foot, how fast you're moving your legs. The reason you can do that that fast is because you spend half a century doing the same thing as slow as possible. How do I apply this in my everyday life? Maybe it's a weird example, but it's a very important example as my life is concerned. I drive a bike, and I wear always my helmet. The thing is, to be honest with you, something I'm ashamed of myself, for five years I was wearing my helmet without the straps. Every helmet has this, two, this double deering strap, which in order to safely make a knot, you need two and a half seconds. But you have to be calm to do this. If you don't have this knot, what it means, if you fall with more than 20, 30 km per hour, your helmet will go out of your head and you will break your head, so probably you'll be in a serious trouble. 
I believe I was not respecting myself for five years not wearing this because my head, I think, is quite important for my life. So, um, what I do now after applying this lesson to my everyday life is that, because usually we're in a hurry, and sometimes we feel that you know these two seconds actually will be late. I don't believe that two seconds make a big difference if you're late. Okay, two seconds later, but if I make this knot, I believe I'm living my life and I appreciate and I respect myself more. And I believe if I'm not able to do this calmly, maybe I should not even drive the bike. Um, second lesson I learned was how to communicate, simple and clear. One thing that psychologists talk about and divers actually see it when they start diving is that you cannot lie under the water. What do I mean? Um, under the water, all your truth is being said by your body language, which means if I move under the water, I'm like this. Obviously, I can't be calm. So you don't really have to ask even somebody if he's okay. You can just look at him and you understand if he's calm, if he's stressed, if he's afraid, or if he's enjoying what he's doing. And um, what actually helps me in my everyday life, a year ago I did one uh, job which was maybe the most interesting and demanding job ever done in my life. It was a lake in the north of Greece, uh, near Kozani. Um, actually, it was not a lake, it became a lake. It was an excavation site. Archaeologist was uh, digging there for the last 30 years. But what happened, actually, the electricity company decided to make a factory and they, made, they turned the whole place into a lake. So I went to film that, how the ancient ruins look now in the lake. The truth was, it was demanding. It was really cold, like three degrees of uh, water. Visibility was less than a meter and a half. People would tell me that there's full of lake sharks in this uh, lake. It's, it's okay to see lake sharks, as long as you can see them. You know, I was a bit weird that maybe the shark here just can't see him, her, or whatever. Anyway. Um, so it was quite demanding. How I work, I have my camera, I can see a monitor, there's a, a line from my monitor to a monitor on the boat, so the director can see what I'm filming, and we can also speak together. When I work with a director, what's really important for me is what he's telling me. Because when I'm filming under the water, especially in demanding situations, somebody who speaks to me, it's like, like I'm praying. So if somebody speaks to me and tells me something positive, it's really important for me. If he tells me something negative and makes me feel like he doesn't, she doesn't really understand what I'm doing under the water, this can destroy all my psychology. And actually what I do, I shut him down. I say, sorry, something broke. I'm sorry, I could not really hear you. Because safety is more important than his happiness. So um, with this director, we work perfectly together, perfectly. Somebody I did not know, we met. In this hard situation, we could communicate simple and clear and work. And, do art, because we're supposed there to make all the shots look nice, the light, everything look nice. Three, four days later, I go to the tax office. Um, I don't want to talk anything, say, about the public sector. Just it happened that day. The person I had to talk with, she was not very in the mood to help me. And I was OK, probably I would come tomorrow, OK, as usual. But then I said, wait, yesterday I was there, minus three degrees. I had to worry about my equipment. I had to think about the sharks. I had to think about the director. I could see nothing, just a meter, and I could communicate with somebody. Here, today, I'm not cold. I don't have to worry about air. It's plenty of air here. Mm, no sharks. So why not communicate? And thinking of this, actually, I do what I have to do. It works for me. I mean, so far. I'm doing this for two months now, but it works. Um, third lesson, breathing. OK, yeah, we all do. But um, how do we do it's quite important. It's also important, it's even more important when you're diving. What do I mean? What happens when we breathe? Very simply, we breathe air. Air contains oxygen, 21%, 20.9 actually. So this is important for life. Without oxygen, my muscles won't be able to move, my brain won't be able to think, and I'll have problems sooner or later. So I breathe in, I take this 21%, this goes to my lungs, back to my artery, my heart beats, goes around my body, produces carbon dioxide, and I exhale this. So when I exhale, I actually exhale 15%, I just used six. I exhale a lot of carbon dioxide plus nitrogen. When somebody breathes, is doing the opposite, doesn't breathe deeply and slowly, uh, what happens? I do this. When I do this, actually what I put back on my, on my lungs is the leftovers for my previous exhalation, which doesn't contain 21% of oxygen, contains 15%. No matter who you are, if you have 15 percent of oxygen, you will faint, you will not feel good. If I don't exhale properly, which means what will happen is carbon dioxide 
which actually stimulates my breathing, regulates my breathing, uh, I will feel this burning feeling. So what we want here, forget about water for a moment, what we want is high oxygen levels, low carbon dioxide level for everybody. That's how we feel good, oxygenated, and we don't feel burned. The opposite, we feel, even now, if you start breathing like this, you won't feel nice. The thing is, if you start breathing like this at 100 meters of depth, where the pressure, it's not one bar, but it's at 10, at 100, it's 11 bars of pressure, it means you're going to produce 11 times more carbon dioxide, and you're going to feel 11 times even worse. Which, actually, what I'm trying to say is that here, breathing properly makes life easier. Down there, the deeper you go, especially, diving properly, breathing properly, I'm sorry, makes life possible, so it's really important. Um, after these three important lessons I learned, I actually realized something quite simple, that uh, water, yeah, is therapeutic. Two years ago, I started a movie, a short movie I did, about uh, a handicapped person, actually, no, a diver that had a diving accident, and the idea is he's trying to reconcile with the sea, and he has to dive again, but it's hard for him to go dive again. To do this movie, one of my most important uh, assistant, assistants, advisors, was the ex-director uh, of the Nautical Hospital of Athens. So we talked a lot, and um, one thing we talked, actually, is uh, what happens, this is the decompression chamber, uh, what happens, for example, with these people in Kalimnos, that um, they had the tradition for many years diving, but unfortunately, because they're diving for centuries, more or less, and for sponges around the world, they didn't know, they didn't have back then the knowledge we do have today as diving physiologists concerned. Uh, as a result, most of them got injured. So even if you go to Kalimnos, you will see many people having decompression sickness, and you will see people walking a bit like this in the port, or if they can walk. The weird thing for most of people is that these people still dive. And it's a bit hard to understand how somebody who can't walk because of diving uh, still goes dive. The reason being that this person, what happens actually when you are injured is, in a very simple way, imagine I'm paralyzed from here down. The reason will be that I have a bubble on uh, my spine, which is big enough not to allow blood to go on my legs. If blood doesn't go to my legs, this means oxygen doesn't go to my legs, so I cannot move. Um, but if I go under the water, where the pressure increases, Boyle, a great physician, told us that when pressure increases, volume decreases. They have a relationship which is anti-proportional, which means when I go to 10 meters, the bowel will become smaller, some blood will start to pass to my leg, and I will start to feel something. I'm not saying somebody completely paralyzed will start to feel 100% okay. I'm just saying that he's going to be better. How much better? It depends on the case, how serious the injury was, when did it happen, how serious was the first aid assistant that was given to that person, and so on. But they, for sure, they feel better. But uh, to be honest, what really touched me with working with this uh, doctor was when I told him, this doctor every day has to spend to do something very hard that I never thought about before, which is somebody, imagine, had an accident yesterday, he wakes up today, and today is the day he realizes that he will never be like he used to be, which is hard, I think, to accept. I never had this experience, but I can imagine it's really hard to accept that. So the doctor has to go and speak to these person, people. I don't think it's hard. So I ask him how these five minutes, when somebody wakes up and realizes he will never walk again, maybe he will never even make love again, what will happen? And the guy said, to be honest with you, especially in the first years of my career, I could not really do this really well. And the reason was that I was not really prepared for the question that people would ask me. And he said that when you see these divers on this really, really hard moment, really, really hard day, everybody, but everybody, asked the same question. They did not ask when they're going to walk again, they just asked when they're going to dive again. And he admitted that he got confused, because he was prepared to answer a completely different question. Now he got used to it, so he knows what to answer. Um, <coughs> This is uh, actually from the movie. Uh, finale, more or less, where Diver K decided to go back to the water. And it's where actually all the therapeutic thing happened, as his soul was concerned, but also as his body is concerned. This is more or less what I'm trying to show here. You can see he cannot move his uh, legs, but he can move his hand. Theoretically, he feels more um, 
delivery here, and you can feel a bit more sensitivity right here. That was uh, shot in uh, Anabisos in uh, Greece. And actually, this is the actor himself. He wanted to learn how to dive, so he's the same who would do the underwater shot. So our rehearsal was actually diving, and we didn't rehearse. <laughs> so um, what I'm trying to tell you, actually, is that uh, I don't think that everybody should start go dive in order to understand what I'm trying to say. Uh, that just works for me. I uh, just think that, um, to be honest with you, actually, 10 years ago, I was just enjoying myself when I was under the water. Surface was not very interesting. And that was completely wrong. Surface is also really nice. And actually, we are not fishers, so we spend more time on the surface. What did just change, and I feel like a happier person today, is that I apply this knowledge to my everyday life. Even this helmet thing I was telling you about, for some reason, is really important for me, because I really think my head is important. And uh, what I recommend is everybody, no matter what you do in your life, if you take what you do good, and you apply it to everyday moments, the way you act, the way you speak, you are to act to other people, then I think this is what actually we need to do. And I think it couldn't be best, but what Aristotle said like 25 centuries ago, which was, we are what we repeatedly do. Um, excellence is not a, an act, excellence is a habit. Thank you for your time and for your attention. Thank you.